Anthony, you can get us started, and then uh, Ben. All right. Well, Coach, obviously, uh, just announced about half hour ago or so, uh, stadium's going to be back to uh, full capacity this weekend. Uh, what's that going to do for your team, and how are you guys feeling about that? One, isn't it great? Like, we're getting back to normal and perfect time of year going into playoffs, and I'm, I can't wait to try to sell the stadium out. I think it's just going to be such an unbelievable atmosphere. I mean, I was excited for the 50%, and I'm just hoping that we get close to 100%. I know the timing is going to – people are going to be scrambling to make some travel arrangements, but I'm just so excited for the players of all four teams to be able to play in, in such a great atmosphere. Coach, given how quickly the uh, the first 50 percent went, um, I know you mentioned that people will will have to make some changes to their arrangements. But do you, do you feel pretty confident you'll be able to have a packed house, uh, given how quickly that first round of tickets went? I, I think so, because I know there was a big waiting list um, and I know our players, they were only allowed to have four people per per student athlete. And they had a lot of kids that are a lot of people that were on the waiting list, family um, and other guests. So. I think we're going to get pretty close. I mean, I would love to see us break the attendance record. That would be something that would be pretty remarkable. But I think, you know, people are just so excited to see playoff softball and for us to be able to play at home. And I'm just hoping that uh, more people get on board and, and want to come out and watch us this great weekend. Andrew and Eric. Coach, do you think uh, there's going to be an adjustment, you know, if, if there is a full house uh, for, for some of your players to, to play in front of that kind of crowd? I mean, well, hopefully more on our side than the visitor side. So I think it's just going to, it's going to add to our energy. Um, you know, we played at Arkansas and they had pretty close to a full out sellout crowd. Tennessee had a great crowd. Um, so we've been in that atmosphere before um, and we're going to expect it from here on out. But, you know, hopefully getting those more people on our side is, is going to add, you know, the 10th man, um, you know, to, to the pressure of the situation, which is really what, what you need. And, and that's part of the advantage of playing at home. Hey, Larissa, had you done anything already in practice, like to simulate crowd noise or anything like that? Uh, and if so, what, and are you now going to double it with, you know, having possibly a full house? Yeah, we did. We started this about a month ago, um, knowing that we were going to have to play on the road at Tennessee and Arkansas. And, and we expected a lot of those other Southeast conference schools were already at a, a higher level capacity. And then obviously with Alabama. So we started playing crowd noise on our PA system during practice, especially with a lot of communication drills, um, things like that. Today, we had a power washer that was washing the whole stadium, so it was pretty loud while we were out there. But um, yeah, it's something that we've been preparing for and then also having a lot of nonverbal communication and making sure that we're relaying our signs and our signals with um, some, some body language stuff that we have in our system. Eric, you can go ahead. Good one. Uh, okay. Uh, I know I've asked you about Cassie Shomo in the past, uh, but just what is it about her play in, in left field that just makes her, I guess, reckless or feel not reckless in that sense, but fearless in terms of just being able to dive all over the place? Are you are you scared? Do you want her to tone it down or do you just kind of let her be? I let her be. I mean, I never ever want a player who is that fearless to to be tentative. Um, really, it's just go full throttle. Um, everyone else get out of her way. And I think when she's played so long next to Brooke Wilmoth, um, it's almost like you can see the priority. It's not strictly just center field. It's Shomo has her range and she's going to catch everything she possibly can. And then Brooke has her range. And it's like everything just shifts towards the right side of the field in terms of who has the most range. If you can imagine like Cassidy Shomo's bubble around her and left is huge. And then Shomo's is going to go into the right center gap. And then, um, Alex Honnold or Abby George, they're, they're going to have a different level of range over in right field. But what makes her so great is her fearlessness, that she just has the, the personal drive that when that ball goes up, she's going to do everything in her power to catch the ball, which is what you, has, want. Has it, you really want that in an outfielder. Has there been one of those catches this year? They're like, there's no way she's getting to that. And then she come out, comes up with it. There's been a couple, especially those foul balls that have been down the line in foul territory. And that ball goes up and I think to myself, like, there's absolutely no way. And then she just dives out of nowhere and, and makes those catches. She had two, I think, against LSU that I thought were really impressive. The hardest one was that line drive right at her that she was diving forward. Um, those are really, really difficult. But again, she just makes them look so easy. Anthony and Colin. 
All right. So uh, on Sunday, you uh, you had mentioned that you've been friends with Coach Carrillo at uh, UIC for about 20 years now. Um, can you kind of describe what that relationship is kind of like and uh, what it'll be like to coach against someone that you've been friends with and known for so long? I, I would say it's, a, it's very professional. Um, a lot of respect for what they've done. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that it was, it's friends like text conversations or our personal relationship. It's more, more colleagues, um, national convention, committees, things like that. You know, when you're around the game as long as I have been, um, you're always gonna run into people that you've seen over a long period of time. And then with myself coming from a mid-major, I've made a lot of mid-major connections over the years. And it's those mid-major coaches that when they see when they see a mid-major coach, especially from the Northeast, moving on to a power conference like the SEC, it gives those mid-major coaches almost goals to say, I can do that too. And that's been something that all through my entire career, even when I was at Hofstra and we were very successful and we went on to super regionals, it gives all those other mid-major programs belief that they can do it as well. So it's, the, it's that type of relationship that you have with some of these coaches on here's a mid-major coach from, from a small conference in the Northeast going on to the SEC and becoming very successful. So it's those people that stay in touch that it's almost like, you know, way to go. Now, now it's something that I can feel like I can attain. Coach, what do these last few days of preparation look like for your team? Uh, what's left on the agenda and where do you feel like this team's at right now? I mean, again, we're playing so well. Um, practices has been great. Practice has been very, very upbeat, um, very positive. Yesterday, we kind of did like an inner squad scrimmage. Um, we know that the teams coming in like to play a lot of short games. So we did some live short game where we had to be able to execute defensively. And then obviously that helps us offensively if we're going to need to bunt. But uh, talking with Chris Malvo, I don't think bunting is on our plan very often. Um, but, you know, it's just it's continue to do some game winning plays. You know, the game is on the line. Uh, we did something really unique that we haven't done yet today at the end of practice. And every single player on the starting, the starting nine on the field had to make the game winning play. So we would put a runner at third a runner at second, and I would hit a ground ball to third. And we had to, we celebrated that it was a game winning play, but it was also putting them in the situation that they had to make the last out of a game. Ben and then Dave. Uh, Coach, your group has, has, sounded very, very confident the last few times that we've talked to them. Do you feel that confidence is still there and, and maybe even growing as you get closer to the regional? It is. I mean, it, it's so much fun to be around. And when I talk to the team, it's literally like wide eyed, let's get going. <clears throat> I mean, we've had more practices this week than we probably had all season long just because of the calendar and we were home on Saturday. Um, but they are, they're so confident. They're so prepared. Um, they've had some great, great couple practices. I know we're going to have another great practice tomorrow. Um, and they're just really looking forward to getting going. You know, at the same time, it's when you, when you look at our opponents, yes, we are the better team, but the better team doesn't always win. So they know that they have to make sure they take care of details and they've been very, very focused. It hasn't been a point where I have to reel them in and almost they can't get, they're not too high. They're very, they're at a very good place right now. Larissa, in these uh, tournament settings where you could play four or five games over 48 hours, just, uh, your pitching setup this year, how, how do you make that become an advantage for you? Or if you feel like it can be? Because we don't rely on one horse. You know, I, I look at some of the, the teams that have relied on one pitcher to do majority of the work, and <clears throat> you cannot get through a regional on one pitcher. You can if you have one, one game a day. But how many pitchers right now are throwing three consecutive days in a row? And they're not. So having a, a pitch by committee philosophy that we've had all year long, they know anyone can be called upon, but again, their pitch count has not been high all year. Um, so I know that they're very, very healthy. They're very fresh. So then they are gonna have the ability to be able to go either deep in a game or be able to throw multiple times throughout the course of the, the three days. Anthony, then Eric. So I spoke with uh, Coach Carrillo yesterday um, about the game, and she kind of mentioned uh, Kayla Wadel at uh, UIC as kind of being their, quote, igniter. Uh, what have you kind of been looking at there, and uh, is, are there any plans to kind of counter her, her impact for uh, UIC? Um, yeah, she, def she definitely is. I mean, she's, her, she's a senior, and she's in that leadoff position. Um, she does have the highest average, and then you add the 14 home runs on top of that. So every time I go into a game, 
I'm acknowledging what is the one player I don't want to beat us. And she would be that one player in making sure that, that we keep her off base. She has 30 stolen bases. Um, so she obviously is a steel threat and she can also hit the ball out of the park. So it's making sure we, we try to get her out by chasing balls. Um, we don't want to give her anything good to hit. And if we walk her, so be it. I know Hattie Moore is going to be able to throw her out. So it's really, it's, it's keeping her out of a position to be able to win the game for them. Larissa, you mentioned on Sunday the various amount of alumni and people you had heard from just that were so excited about the program. Just can you, you don't have to name names or anything like that, but can you kind of just tell me, you know, what some of those conversations have been like and just, you know, I, I, it seems like you've been here much longer than it's only three year anniversaries next week. Just kind of just walk me through what kind of that acceptance has been like. You know, it's been some screenshots of them watching the game on TV, um, some stuff that they've seen on social media, um, sending it to me and just saying, we're so proud of what you've done with the program. Thank you for getting us back to the level that we were before. Um, and I'm getting a lot of messages from the kids that have been there before, the kids that went, the Chelsea Thomas era, and even before, the ones that went have gone to the World Series. Just glad to see that the program's back up and we're an eight seed and you know, that we're able to turn it around as fast as we were. Really, it's the, it's the appreciation. It's, it's them recognizing that we're really doing it for them. Colin? Yeah, Larissa, I know you mentioned on Sunday that you're not going to have access to the home locker room because of the NCAA protocols, COVID, I guess. Um, what else is going to be different? What is, I guess we'll see it Friday, but what's the setup going to look like at the field that's different? Um, you guys probably won't notice anything that's different. He'll be more from an internal standpoint. Um, we don't have access to our coach's room. Our players won't have access to the locker room. Um, so we're going to have to be able to transport everything into Hearns. Um, we're going to utilize the volleyball locker room for a little bit for, so they do have a, a ability to be able to change into their uniforms and not have to bring all that stuff back to their apartments. Um, some of the pregame meal stuff. So little things like that, we just have to make some adjustments on where we're gonna have team meetings since we can't utilize the locker room. And then entrance to and from the stadium is a little bit different. Um, have to follow some strict NCAA COVID protocol in where we enter. So you're not, so you have tier one individuals and tier two that we're not having the athletes interact with anyone who's not in a tier one level. Any other questions for coach? Thanks coach. Cool, thanks guys.